Um, well, good morning from London. Uh, good afternoon to those of you uh, in the Middle East. Um, I'm very, very pleased today to um, present the first of the webinars in our series on financial centers of the world of 2021 uh, with a focus on Dubai, uh, and in particular the Dubai International Financial Center. Um, my job here this morning is uh, very much to open the proceedings. Uh, you'll hear from me a bit later. Um, <clears throat> but first, I want to give a mention to uh, the sponsors uh, that we rely on at the FS Club to provide these series of webinars, and um, in particular to allow us to uh, venture far and wide across the fields of finance um, and uh, uh, technology. Uh, we are really grateful for the support uh, of our sponsors, and um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll come back to the sponsors at the end. Our agenda this morning is very simple. Um, me to give an introduction, but to um, get out of your out of the way, really, to hand over to Salman Jaffrey, the Chief uh, Business Development Officer at the IFC Authority, uh, to talk about Dubai, its current uh, development and position, um, and to provide you with an insight uh, as to um, how Dubai has positioned itself uh, as a financial centre uh, in the Middle East, Africa. Um, our speakers this morning, uh, myself and Salman, uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions towards the end of the session. Uh, for those of you who have not been on the GoToWebinar uh, system before, the way to put a question in is to find the question panel uh, on the dashboard on your screen. You can there type a question in uh, and send it on. Um, at the end, then uh, we'll field those questions um, and uh, hope to have a good uh, discussion and pick up on the points that you raise. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Simon Jaffrey uh, to give his thoughts on Dubai as a financial centre uh, and where it currently stands. Thank you very much. Super. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and to all the organisers and to the sponsors for arranging for today's conversation. And I say conversation because even though I'll be reviewing some slides, uh, what I'd really like to do is to engage in a um, hopefully an interactive conversation with the distinguished uh, audience uh, on some themes that are, I think, interesting and relevant to, to all of us uh, where, where we are. So with that, um, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. My name is Salman Jaffrey, and I um, represent the business development function at the DIFC, where I have been for five years. And look, um, the the logical place to start is maybe to acknowledge the fact that there are um, a lot of us on a digital platform speaking to one another from different parts of the world. And we are sitting here in Dubai. I'm in my office at the Dubai International Financial Center um, at the maybe the midst of uh, one of the major pandemics that the world has ever seen. And we seem to have um, come to a an interesting equilibrium here, at least in Dubai, where We've seen the rapid acceleration of using digital platforms like this. We've seen innovation in the, the area of healthcare, which has allowed uh, Dubai as a much smaller uh, economy and society to function uh, with a, probably a higher degree of uh, quote unquote normalcy than some other places. And that sets the right context because the story of the DIFC in Dubai really is about a young society that has found its place on the global economy as a result of a history that's steeped in commerce and trade and diversity. And so for the next maybe 15, 17 minutes or so, I want to talk about probably three things. I will uh, talk very briefly about the foundational principles behind why um, uh, a financial center in this region makes sense. And I'll talk briefly, I'll zip through some slides, talk about what we've done collectively here, which is essentially aggregate capital and talent. Having done that, um, I'll talk a, a little bit about, actually a fair, a, bit, a fair amount about the problems that we're trying to solve here uh, now and going forward and, and the innovation and digital agenda uh, is front and center. And then maybe what we'll do is we'll close with uh, our vision for what's next on the future of finance. And so, uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind, if we could uh, begin with the first slide, please. So 
this slide and the next and the next slide are really designed to give you the audience a general sense of why is it that we should have a financial center here in Dubai. And the answer is really very straightforward. Okay. There's a history of trade and commerce here. And the reason why there's a history of trade and commerce here is because we are at the crossroads quite literally between um, you know, three continents. And so the Miasa is the market opportunity to which we to which we refer, Middle East, Africa, South Asia. And what that says basically is that the market opportunity here for those in Dubai is never really about Dubai. It sometimes is, but it's not about Dubai, which is a small market. It's often not about the UAE. It's sometimes not even about the GCC, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council of six countries, but it's really about a larger market opportunity. And so there's a large market that has uh, a large population of young people. And the key takeaway there is relative to financial centers, let's say in North America or in Europe or even uh, East Asia or the Far East, our demographic uh, pyramids are inverted relative to yours, if that's where you sit. What that simply means is that we have a lot more people at the bottom of the pyramid who are young. And what that simply means is that we have a lot of people who are going to be consuming services, including financial services and digital services for a long time. And that really is the anchor for any business case that any company is going to rely on when they come to the IFC and to Dubai. The corollaries of that, of course, are that emerging markets, as all of you know, have been growing really, really fast. Um, the third box refers to financial services. And again, um, our markets uh, have grown very, very rapidly in Miasa, 750 billion plus as of two years ago significant growth and i go back to the demographics um, on the right it says high digital penetration what typically happens is younger populations um, in developed and underdeveloped areas have a disproportionate use of digital so in dubai the old joke is oh you only have two phones huh two mobile phones and the point is here is that taken together this is there are some great uh growth uh, uh prospects for financial services. I should add, by the way, that uh, we will make this presentation available to those interested afterwards. So I may, uh, that will allow us to go through the slides relative, relatively quickly. Next slide, please. Thanks, Mike. Um, I've dwelled on this already. I think Dubai has done a really, really good job of putting itself on the map. Okay. Um, and that only happens when you have top-down leadership that recognizes the core asset, which is the 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 rich diversity of people here and its location and essentially we've built a great place where everything works the infrastructure is great and top talented people like yourselves want to come here and work and i can tell you um yes it gets really hot here for at least three or four months but otherwise it's not a bad place to be climactically as well and and really i'm going to skip through this but but the point is that to to get the right people you have to have the right environment and Dubai, across all those measures of lifestyle, education, safety, security, talent, has done a really, really phenomenal job. And we're very focused on that. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the next probably eight to 10 slides, I will zip through relatively quickly. The purpose of the next eight to 10 slides is to give the audience a snapshot of the key markets where uh, the DIFC in Dubai have provided great platforms. So you'll forgive me in advance if I don't dwell on, on the individual slides too much, but I'm going to go through three or four sectors, banking, wealth management, insurance, and of course, uh, private equity and, uh, and BC. So we talked about uh, emerging markets growing faster, um, spreads and financial services products here generally have been faster growing and more profitable than other markets in the world. And I think that story is well known. Next slide, please. Uh, as a corollary, because there's a lot of investment here in infrastructure, because I've told you about the fact that young people here in Miasa, they need hospitals and bridges and education and highways. Those activities require financing. Financing attracts transactions. Transaction attracts banks and people. And so naturally corporate financing remains um, a, a, a big opportunity. Uh, I hasten to add, of course, um, these slides have not been normalized for COVID, but the story is still uh, cohesive and, and makes and makes sense. Next slide, please. 
And again, um, some more data uh, through a couple of years ago uh, about the, the volume of business uh, that's happening here over time. I will say one quick thing, which is COVID um, ready, which is that, you know, the last nine months or so, we've seen stability in corporate banking here, uh, flight to quality with uh, with clients, with, with, with strong clients, um, established clients. We've also seen a significant um, increase in advisory business, which is not surprising because families and corporates have started to recapitalize, restructure, uh, and that's been uh, pretty, pretty uh, good for the advisory firms and the investment banks. Um, next slide, please. So we've talked about, you know, traditional financial services from a balance sheet perspective and, a, and an advisory perspective. Uh, perspective. You know, we uh, as a region are very well known for having substantial pools of capital. Now, the sovereign capital gets a lot of press because uh, they're big and they, they make big moves, but equally important, and I think this is a, a key message, a key takeaway to those who don't know the region, is that there's a large commensurate amount of private capital as well. And over time, what you're going to see is you're going to see state-led top-down economic growth being slowly replaced by bottoms-up private sector growth. And I think the private wealth pools are just one source of that. They play an important role in financing, uh, given that our capital markets, while growing robustly, are still not as deep. And I'll come back to this theme again. Next slide, please. Um, the market, so there's a lot of liquidity in the market. And I think uh, the key message for the DIFC uh, is that because we have this incredible 16-year-old um, platform that's English common law based with our own courts, our own company's laws, our own jurisdiction, we've been able to provide a platform for uh, nearly $500 billion of capital being either portfolio uh, managed or relationship managed here. So you have licensed, dedicated uh, relationship managers, portfolio managers sitting in the DIFC that either invest money or manage money for corporate, sovereigns, institutions, families, um, and other enterprises. And that's that's become a really, really important um, platform for the DIFC. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is a corollary. Um, it it, it ha has to do with the fact that the amount of wealth created here in the private sector is is, is significant. And not surprisingly, there is a large number of uh, very, very affluent people. And this supports the wealth and private banking businesses, which are very, very competitive here. Next slide, please. Uh, let's, uh, let's skip this one and let's go to the next one, please. Thank you. Oh, back one, please. Thank you. Perfect. Um, within the within the the sphere of um, asset management, uh, so again the idea off balance sheet of capital being intermediated into sectors either via investment via managers is a new asset class for us. By new I mean five or six years old. I mean it's been around, but really the venture capital. So the, the private equity sector has been around for quite some time, particularly since I talked about the significant infrastructure investment that's happened for for a long time here. Um, real estate, infrastructure, Islamic finance. VC is a new asset class which has um, grown significantly quickly, not surprisingly, and it's following the growth of technology, innovation, and fintech, uh, about which I'll spend a fair amount of time in the subsequent slides. But we're happy to see the pools diversifying. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm closing on the big three. Talked about banking a little bit, talked a little bit about wealth and asset management with a little bit of focus on VC. Um, insurance and reinsurance is also a critical mar uh, critical market for us. Look, um, in all these areas, we are the, the largest kind of market uh, for reinsurance between London and um, Singapore. And um, a few things drive the success. The platform has been tremendous. Um, like a lot of other financial services, Penetration uh, for insurance products, whether it is health or property and casualty or commercial or uh, different lines, penetration is, is, is versus the globe is low. So there's lots of room for growth. And our platform is particularly strong for reinsurance. We're able to take insurance risks from all around the region and onshore, and we're able to um, uh, put, that, put those risks into global reinsurance markets. So that I think we, we remain pretty bullish on that. Next slide, please. And again, this this slide essentially shows the fact that um, uh, you know there's great reinsurance potential because of the fact that um, you know 
the the higher reinsurance uh, session rates uh, suggest that a lot more um, uh, reinsurance uh, happens uh, here uh, versus the global average. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. So. In, in covering these three sectors in banking, capital markets, wealth and asset management, insurance, what I've essentially done is given you um, a quick summary of what we've done really, really well for 16 years. Um, a couple of data points for you. In these 16 years, I mean, we have you know over 26,000 people work here every day in this center. Okay, in the 110 acre space, over 25,000 or 26,000 people work here. There are over 2,700 companies that are registered here. It's a real deep and rich ecosystem. What I've described, and then of course, lawyers and accountants and everyone that you need to conduct financial services. What I'm now pivoting to is, okay, so we did that really well for 16 years. What's happening now? Well, naturally with uh, FinTech globally um, and us being a financial center, we pivoted aggressively towards FinTech. That journey is, is now in its fourth year. And the upshot is, the upshot is that we have successfully replicated that um, scale, the scale that we acquired in financial services, we've, we've done so in fintech. Um, last year, we we grew to, as of end of December, we're th almost 300. So this slide is now dated. We have almost 300 uh, uh, fintech firms. They're mostly fintech, but some are other, some other innovation companies. Um, and that's a dominant market share in the region. So I'd say closer to 60% of market share, we have those companies here. Um, next slide, please. I won't go into the, the specifics here, but my, I guess my key message is when it comes to innovation and fintech, um, every market has its own unique opportunities. And I would say that the Middle East, particularly out of DIFC in Dubai, um, technology, fintech and innovation have solved, uh, are solving a couple of key pain points. Uh, so I've, I've picked a couple. One is that, you know, our natural uh, labor uh, distributions are such that we have uh, four or five of the largest remittance corridors in the world between here, by here I mean UAE, GCC, into emerging markets like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Philippines, okay? And remittance um, is a costly uh, economic transaction, particularly for low-income people. And so we have the regs and an ecosystem of payments companies that are trying to make that better and more efficient. So it's a great, great opportunity for the market. The other area, I'll just pick two for discussion. The other area is broadly speaking, um, rec tech or anything that makes the process of KYC or AML or anti-money laundering or counterterrorism financing, any technology that enables financial institutions and people to do that seamlessly and make it quicker and faster and less painless, that's a great opportunity for us, and, and we have a particular uh, set of uh, concerns in that space. So uh, those are some examples of uh, use cases for technology. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so all of this, I think I've mentioned a lot of this. Um, the key message here is that you know we've done, we, we have the world's top companies. We're very proud of it. At the bottom, you can see banks, asset managers, insurance companies, law firms, and of course, fintech. On the right-hand side, you'll see a list of, of benefits um, that we that we provide companies for being here. It's no taxation, there's no restrictions on ownership, no restrictions on movement of capital, repatriation, things like data protection, GDPR compliant data protection is really important. Um, acceleration for fintech. The fintech hive is the region's first fintech accelerator, and it's done a remarkable job of helping us aggregate the best talent from the region. Payments regulations were the only regulation here on, that's comprehensive when it comes to digital payments. Really, really amazing. Uh, sandboxes. We uh, we have a $100 million, not $100, $100 million uh, fintech fund. So there's a lot here um, that underscores this commitment to fintech. If I could go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. Great. Okay. Let me conclude uh, with, so I talked about what we did earlier in traditional financial services. I gave you a summary of what we've done for fintech. What's happening now is we, uh, the, the next and kind of logical phase of development is our commitment to 
broadening that conversation, right? Um, COVID has has exposed uh, vulnerabilities uh, in global economics when it comes to things ranging from communications, healthcare, supply chains, delivery, uh, customer access. And, and so when we think about what's next, we think not just about fintech, we think broadly about what will digitize this economy and regional economies. Because ultimately, and maybe I should have started with this, we were created 16 years ago, ultimately to drive economic growth and job creation for Dubai and for UAE. And so when you take a step back, the question we're trying, what we're trying to solve for is, how do we enable the digitization of multiple sectors that drive economic growth, that will bring jobs and high value economic growth here? And we think that the future of finance is, is the way that we're going to do that. Let me just spend a minute or two on that means. Next slide, please. Look, I think the the 30 second summary here is that we are a financial center. We are, we are an enabler. We've been a platform, which means we've allowed licensed firms to come here, to get the best people here and to operate from here. Okay, and we did it really well. We are moving in the direction of a lot more partnership and enablement along digital axes. So. We want to help our our clients grow, right? We want them to uh, continue to grow faster than the market. So our our firms do better than the market. We want to continue that. We want to connect investors and financiers and companies together the right way. We want to continue to make Dubai in this region even better uh, and even a better place for business. We want to enable people to get things done quickly, smoothly with as little friction as possible and at low cost or lower cost rather, right? These are all business problems that people are aware of. We want to build ecosystem, but this time these ecosystems are going to be digital. And we are thinking through, and I, I welcome the feedback from the audience about um, what people are seeing, but we, we see an interesting mix of the physical and virtual layers. Very interesting. And last but not least, from a from a from a financial services perspective, we know that the rules have to be have to protect uh, consumers and the economy, but have to have to innovate. Our regulator, which is the DFSA, continues to regulate in the space in a manner that's that's really outstanding. If we could uh, go to the next slide, um, look. What this is simply saying is that there are a lot of specific ventures uh, or growth themes that we're looking, that we're already working on, both to do it ourselves and to partner with other people on. And let me conclude with the next and last slide. I'll end my discussion by simply saying that, you know, these things don't happen by themselves. They happen with significant um, top down and sideways collaboration between a lot of different bodies, ranging from got pure government to regulators to enablers and what we would like to do is to ensure that we remain central to that conversation because we think that getting it right will help dubai will help the uae and ultimately the region and with that i will conclude my remarks i think i'm i think i'm on time i hope so Thank you. Uh, well, Salman, thank you very much indeed. A fascinating um, overview um, of where Dubai, uh, the, the IFC, have reached um, and some really uh, challenging thoughts about the future uh, and what's going to uh, be available uh, with digitization. Um, I just want to add a few thoughts um, from the N uh, on Dubai. Um, we've obviously been tracking uh, Dubai and the Global Financial Centers Index uh, since we started the index in 2007. Um, and from our perspective, Dubai is a very high performing center. It's um, firmly in the top 20 global centers over recent years. It's been up as high as eighth in the rankings um, and you know, has consistently performed well. It's just 10 points out of a thousand away from being in the current top 10 um, in the index. Um, so really a very highly performing center for what is, as Salman said, a quite a small uh, center in terms of population. Um, but clearly the leading center in Middle East and Africa in terms of its financial reach, and particularly well regarded in investment management circles. So when we um, look at the people who rate uh, Dubai in the uh, GFCI survey, 
uh, people from investment management uh, in particular uh, rated by very highly. Um, and in terms of its underlying fa uh, underlying strengths, um, human capital and business environment factors uh, really stand out for Dubai uh, in terms of its performance in the GFCI. Um, so there's some, some thoughts, but one of the other analyses we do um, is how well connected financial centers are. Uh, and on this slide, you can see the, um, the number of lines um, are very strong, which means that there are uh, connections formed uh, with a large number of other financial centers across the world. And the strongest links uh, on this chart uh, are to the leading uh, major financial centers, Hong Kong, New York, London, Singapore, uh, but also increasingly growing links to mainland China. Um, and this connectivity is something which I think uh, you know, makes Dubai stand out amongst the uh, Middle Eastern centers, just in terms of uh, the strength and breadth of, of connections uh, built between financial um, <clears throat> professionals in Dubai with uh, people in other parts of the world. And so that was all I was going to do by way of a brief commentary from an external perspective, um, but it's now is on to uh, an opportunity uh, to open that discussion that Salman mentioned uh, in terms of uh, the, the question session. I have a number of questions already uh, with me. Do keep them coming. Um, we've got around about 15 minutes to uh, answer the questions that you raised for us. And I'm going to start with um, a question from Arisa, uh, just commenting a financial center is a meeting place for lenders, investors, borrowers, project sponsors needing equity. Um, do, do we know how much money has been raised or lent for non-GCC borrowers or project sponsors um, from the investor base in the GCC uh, via Dubai? You know, what's the kind of scale of, of that investment outside the GCC? Yeah, so look, I, I can tell you uh, the data that we have, which may or may not answer the question. Um, I'm able to 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 provide data on two on uh, from two perspectives. One is I can I can repeat um, the number I mentioned earlier, which is the quantum of money that is raised and managed from the DIFC, um, and it's invested. Uh, into the global markets and regional markets. And that amount is roughly about, at last count, uh, in the neighborhood of, you know, $450 billion. Okay. What that means is that that is the total sum of money that comes from, um, corporates, families, sovereigns, uh, in the region. And, and it, it gets invested globally and regionally. Now, what, the, what the mix of, of that 500 is, in terms of source is hard is hard to parse out. I can also share, for example, the fact that roughly about 180 billion dollars worth of uh, uh, financing assets are are written here from DIFC banks. So what that means is that the total value of let's say assets that are that are written here uh, from banks that are licensed here is about 180 billion. And then, then there's a hundred there's a, a hundred billion other, actually it's technically 99, but it's a hundred billion more that gets sold here and booked elsewhere. So you start adding the numbers, you have 500 roughly for asset management, you have 180 plus 100, so roughly 280 that are that are that banks are responsible for and it starts to become a pretty big number. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question here from Bob McDowell. I was just asking what impact, if any, do you think the UK's departure from the European Union will have on the actors of the DIFC? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we, we uh, full disclosure, we, we asked that question of ourselves and our clients actually when Brexit first was announced. And uh, I'll tell you my personal view. I mean, I'm still scratching my head. I mean, as, you know, we tried to say, we try to quantify what the impact would be, and I have to say that you know, was is it three years? Three years in, or however long it's been since um, um, it's been a wash uh, for the most part, in the sense that the the relative, the rough distribution of uh, the sources of where our clients come from uh, has 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 basically remained unchanged. So, so for example, it is not the case that there was a dramatic change in the mix of EU companies coming here or or UK companies. I will say that there was a, a, a UK companies. The share of UK firms that came here went up by a couple of percentage points. But so so it's hard. It's hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify that measure. 
Okay, and and I think the question said, you know, what impact, if any, and if it sounds like there really has been minimal impact in the um, opportunities available in the IFC. Um, Paul Dooley's got a question. He says there's also talk about open banking and central bank digital currencies, um, and whether there's a particular movement in the UAE in this respect. Uh, he's asking because his company supports some central banks with hiring international fintech expertise, uh, so he has a, a, an interest in this. Um, so central bank digital currencies. Yeah, so uh, first thing I'll say is happy to talk about this in much more detail offline with anyone who who who, uh, who wants to learn more about it. Let me paint a couple of uh, themes. The first thing is that um, the, the use cases in financial services uh, in the UAE and Dubai for uh, distributed ledger technology uh, uh, are, are wide and accepted. So DLT, our uh, blockchain, um, is an accepted technology and platform. Um, there is a blockchain council here. It is a technology that, that the government uses, and there is absolutely no obstacle to, to using that in a number of different ways. Number two, um, it has been d deployed, uh, including by us, uh, in a number of instances, particularly when it comes to rec tech. Okay, um, there have been use cases around the use uh, use, use of um, DLT for for wills and things like that. The one use case which has has attracted a lot of debate and discussion and is still uh, not implemented is the use case for a digital for a digital currency. Um, because that has obviously significant impact on the financial system. Um, so what I will say is that the conversation from three years ago has moved forward. I think, speaking on, uh, for, on, on behalf of the DIFC, I think the DIFC um, does not have an issue with the use of uh, digital securities uh, per se. We have at least one instance of, of a company that has uh, issued them. Um, I think the case for invest of uh, investment funds having digital assets, I think, is is something that will 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 be uh, more acceptable, and the case for exchanges will be more acceptable. Um, open banking is a larger conversation. The one liner there is that our payments and money services regime, that conversation in the DIFC, okay, and in the UAE, I think, is going to be the leading edge of the sp uh, of the spear for a transition into open banking. When we get digital payments right from a KYC perspective, from a digital onboarding perspective, uh, except, uh, from an API perspective, I think that will enable a uh, conversation on open banking. I can simply say that it's an active discussion between the regulators as we speak. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting quite a few questions in. Uh, we'll get a few as through as many as we can. If we do run out of time, um, let me assure you, we'll pass on um, any unanswered questions um, to our colleagues in the IFC and make sure there's an opportunity for the discussion to continue. But I've got two kind of linked questions, I guess, one from Robert Pay, one from John Goodellis. Um, first of all, can we comment, can, can you comment at all on the improving geopolitical situation and liberalization of the Middle East and its impact on Dubai, thinking in particular of the Abraham Accord? And then secondly, you know, without getting political, what can be said about the political stability of the region and the impact on the financial services industry? So those two aspects, sure. the Abraham Accord and generally. Sure. No. So you're right to say that we, you know, we we don't we don't talk politics. Um, we focus on the business opportunities. But I think it is clear from an economic perspective, and I'm I'm citing essentially public uh, public sources here. Um, in the past, let's say three and a half four years ago, you had two external shocks to regional markets. Right. You had um, political uh, issues, whether they were kind of regional conflicts or regional political disputes, and then you had oil. Okay, all else being equal, right? Those two external, um, wh whenever there's a drag in, on those two areas, it's generally not great for business. Okay, now we've had we have an incredibly diverse um, economy, at least within the DIFC and, and certainly Dubai, and we've managed to navigate the last four years quite well. So when oil went down, you know, guess what? Digital went up. Uh, when oil went down and 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 some of the um, uh, financing decreased, we saw a, uh, an increase in off-balance sheet, you know, investment. So there's always been an offset. But anyway, um, that being said, today, obviously, some of the background political um, stresses seem to have abated, which is good news. And 
and uh, we are very bullish on the Abraham Accords. I think um, uh, there are significant opportunities for uh, exchange, uh, mutual benefit in a number of areas, but but in particular in technology, uh, in fintech, uh, healthcare, uh, agriculture. So these are all areas that I think are actively being discussed, and um, the engagement has been very, very strong. Super. Um, a, a question about, I guess, international competition, um, asking how Dubai positions itself via the growing markets of South Asia, where you are you know, heavily involved, uh, especially India. You know, Is there a chance that Mumbai will become your competitor uh, to Dubai? Um, how are you positioning yourself? Look, um, the reality, uh, Mike, is that um, if you look at it from a um, strictly speaking, I mean, everyone competes with everybody, right? So at any given point, um, you, you know, particularly when we start talking about, um, you know, being ranked in the top 10 or top 20, uh, implicit in that is to have a proposition that in some ways has advantages over other jurisdictions because ultimately what's going to drive economic growth here in Dubai is to get more people here uh, who are very talented to come here, to live here, and to conduct business here for longer periods of time. So yeah, in that regard, we compete with everybody, but but we have a slightly different way of, of operationalizing it. We're also a very diverse community and we, we have linkages and dependencies on key adjacent markets. So for example, you mentioned Mumbai. Yeah, you know, in in one respect, Mumbai may be a competitor, but we also view India and Mumbai as key partners because we source a lot of amazing talent and companies from Mumbai and from India, right? So it's not as straightforward as us competing with you know a particular city or not. And the last thing I'll say is what served us well is to really focus on what we're good at. And as long as we do that, I think you know things fall where they fall. So. We're, we're trying to focus on what Dubai and DIFC, uh, um, on our strengths. Thanks very much. Um, Mike Halson said he was um, in Dubai for a while and he saw quite a lot of empty buildings and was wondering uh, what is it that means Dubai seems to overbuild, uh, given that lenders and insurance companies signed off on those projects, you know, so they were viable. Um, but he's just interested in the sort of the, the relationship between the amount of built environment and the, the, the level of business. Yeah, there's no question. Um, I mean, it's uh, it, it's an open se- it's it's not a, there's no secret that um, uh, we we had and still have excess capacity in real estate. Um, and, but but that's what markets are for. And so as a result, um, the market has has started to function like a market. I mean, I'd say that um, before my time, maybe ten years ago, when you had the preceding um, asset inflation in in real estate. Uh, many have said that you know maybe the market didn't function as efficiently as it should have. But I can tell you today, uh, there is excess capacity, and 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 that's why I think uh, businesses are adapting their delivery pipelines, both in terms of in- inventory and the timing of it, uh, because people aren't going to buy unless it makes sense. I can also say, and I'm I'm not I'm not a real estate specialist by any means, but I can also say that. There is enough diversification of certainly in commercial real estate and residential real estate now that that pockets of of demand and quality really stand out. So if you look at downtown Dubai, for example, you'll you'll my real estate uh, expert friends say that um, much like major centers globally, uh, the values in those particular markets have held. Mm. So yeah, so I think I think the market's starting to work. Yeah, so there might be some bargains to be had. <laughs> Um, that's super. Uh, we have a, a quite specific question from Lisa Muller, who says that um, if this is too specific for the session, we, she's very happy to take it offline. Um, but saying with operational resilience emerging as a key theme for global regulators, um, how is DIF, DFSA approaching this and incorporating the management of cyber risk um, as part of its operational risk um, management? Yeah. So look, I think that we should discuss offline because I I I I I couldn't speak on behalf of the DFSA. Um, what I will say is that the DFSA takes cybersecurity very seriously, and 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 there are a few um, uh, programs built into how they look at it. 
But um, if I could ask for your indulgence and we could talk offline, I'd be happy to get you that information. I would hate to misspeak on their behalf. <laughs> That's fine. We'll make sure that we get you in contact with Anita uh, after the event. Um, Vladimir Dimitrov has asked about, um, he said you fast forwarded the slides over private banking and wealth management quite rightly, but interest, he's interested whether there's a strategy and actions to reverse the historic fact that uh, the majority of local regional private wealth uh, is held and managed overseas. Are there initiatives, yeah. incentives to attract um, HNWIs to, you know, bank with Dubai, Dubai-based institutions and use the services of Dubai-based wealth management um, funds and, uh, and organizations? Yeah, that observation is 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 actually is is absolutely correct. Um, but some context is important. So I'd say you know, uh, pre 9/11, okay, the it was absolutely the case that the region's uh, wealth was uh, predominantly offshore. Uh, post 9/11, and of course because of the establishment of the DIFC, um, we have uh, started to slowly backtrack against that trend. Um, is it accurate? For, is it accurate for me to say that the trend is reversed? Of course not. Um, of course not. But we've made significant progress. And in fact, our first license, license number one, was a private bank here. So, so um, we are making progress um, more than in the past. Um, more family wealth is um, is is being uh, managed in the region from the DIFC. And I will say that um, in the last year or so, there's definitely been uh, a renewed interest uh, from uh, European wealth also uh, and Asian wealth to look at uh, this platform for a whole bunch of reasons, ranging from diversification to kind of uh, area risk, et cetera. So, um, yeah. That's super. Um, we're, we're fast running out of time. We do have quite a few more questions to go. So if we don't get through them, um, I will make sure they're passed on and so the conversation can continue offline. Um, but Anita's asked a second question, having uh, she asked the question about regulation. Um, but to what extent are the perceived barriers for professional women and anyone who's older coming to Dubai being addressed? I'm obviously wanting to make Dubai an attractive place for experienced professionals. Um, and are there specific things we're doing for professional women and, uh, and people who are the, in the older part of the workforce like me? Okay, sure. Well, look, um, you know, as a father of, of two girls, I am I am sensitive to uh, all questions in that space. Uh, let me try and answer it as, as fairly as I can. Look, I think first and foremost, um, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this region, uh, I think it is safe for me to say that um, this place is the most popular um, place for expats, men and women to want to come and live and work. And I think that's not an opinion, that's just a statement of fact. And I think um, the earlier slides that I showed about you know, quality of living, education, safety, security, all that stuff uh, falls into place and it makes it a place where uh, as a man or a woman from a different part of the world, you're, you're um, relative to the surrounding areas, I think this is a very, very good place to be. When it comes to specifics, I, the only thing I can do in fairness is to point to a lot of uh, female leadership examples, both in the government here and in the private sector. I can tell you at the DIFC, um, half of our management team um, um, are, are, are female, are women. It's something we take very seriously. And um, while I don't, you know, I wouldn't wish to comment on the specifics of, of, a, of a larger gender issue when it comes to uh, employment, I, I, I can tell you that um, uh, this is a, a pretty progressive uh, place and jurisdiction for, pi for public and private enterprise. That's super. I'm going to take one more question before we have to move on, I'm afraid. Um, just John Goodellis has asked about ESG performance. Um, you know, it's now moving to center stage as a performance indicator. Um, and how far is this a relevant concern uh, in Dubai and the IFC? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk to um, talk talk to him offline as well because there's a lot to say look um how do i summarize uh the ESG agenda is super important for a bunch of reasons uh we are obviously a, a traditional hydrocarbon economy that is diversifying aggressively so that's that's a part of it there's a young population that has a different view on environmental issues that's part of it um the government has talked about uh, sheikh mohammed himself has 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 talked very uh, proactively about the need uh, about the green agenda 
There are solar farms here. There is financing of ESG here. Islamic finance takes that very seriously. Um, we have a DIFC organization called Hokama, which is Institute for Corporate Governance, which has an ESG index. Um, I hope I've, I've uh, made the right citation. Uh, there's ministries here. So there's a lot happening here. Um, and I'd be delighted to talk to the, uh, to the individual who asked the question offline. But it's, 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 it's super important for us. Well, thank you very much. It sounds like we need to invite you back later in the year to have a follow up session because there's still a number of questions <laughs> that remain unanswered. Uh, we will pass on um, you know, to uh, Salman and his colleagues uh, all the comments and questions that we've had. Um, just to say that um, a couple of people have just put a comment in just saying uh, how, how much they appreciate your time and how fascinating and interesting they found your presentation and uh, the discussion uh, was uh, this morning, so afternoon. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I'm just going to very quickly uh, bring us to a finish. First of all, by uh, telling you about upcoming uh, events we have um, just tomorrow, an update on EU financial services legislation. And on Friday, owning your place in the 21st century economy. It's been a busy week for our webinars this week. Um, next week, um, we have uh, events on EU insurance mutuals and corporate cooperatives and um, a fully grown uh, uh, you know, session which is focusing on why a stagnant economy is a sign of success. So please do keep um, abreast with what we're doing at the FS Club uh, and the events we have in place. Um, and finally, um, thank yous. Um, thank you first to our sponsors for allowing us to put on this series of webinars um, and being in support of us. Um, an indication here of where you can take part in the Global Financial Centers Index the next edition to be published in March of uh, this year. Um, and the survey is open 24-7, uh, so do please take a look. Um, we ha have been recording this session, and the recording will be available online in a couple of days. Uh, we'll send out an email to those who participated. The slides also um, are available up on the, on the website now. Just remains for me to thank uh, very sincerely Salman for his time today uh, and for a fascinating presentation. Um, as is the way of the world these days, we can't uh, give you the round of applause that you so uh, richly deserve. You'll have to make do with a very small uh, round of applause, but imagine that magnified uh, many times. Um, so thank you indeed. Uh, thank you all for your participation. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at our future events. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike.